strabismus, and we expect to have different opinions to co for correction of the same problem. That's why we are so excited for today's meeting. And uh, you can watch uh, uh, this meeting uh, through the Zoom platform or via the live uh, Facebook streaming. But we do recommend that you can join us via the Zoom uh, platform so you can engage with us with questions, with your questions. And we would be very grateful if you leave your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. So for all of us to follow you and maybe answer you live or even by uh, uh, texting. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Novartis company for sponsoring this meeting and uh, the RM organizing company for organizing this meeting. Let me tell you about uh, today, uh, tonight, uh, in, uh, our speakers tonight. Uh, we have uh, Professor Dr. Craig McEwen, uh, Boston Palmer, uh, Univers um, uh, I Institute, Miami University. And we have Professor uh, Surab Jain, the Royal Free, Free uh, London Hospital. Uh, and we have as well our dear professor and my mentor, Professor Dr. Akmar Rez, uh, from the Research Institute of Ophthalmology. And we have also my dear colleague, Ayman Ogunini, for the discussion and the reoperation uh, cases. And now uh, I will uh, uh, let Dr. Ayman Ogunini uh, present uh, our uh, uh, speakers to all of you. Yeah, very good evening, uh, all of you. Uh, we're very excited to have you. Uh, first, I would like to uh, uh, show our condolences for uh, those who, in this uh, era uh, of, of COVID-19, for those who passed away, and uh, also our sympathy for those who are suffering from disease, and our sympathy with our friends and colleagues in the front lines. Um, and we will all fight Corona, and we will will fight it by keeping learning, keeping uh, exchanging our experience. We have to keep keep life going on. Um, I'm um, I'm very glad and honored uh, uh, to welcome all our uh, guest speakers uh, for tonight. Um, that's very exciting to to have uh, all these expertise in one uh, in one place. Um, I would like to uh, to welcome the uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed. Uh, professor Doc Dr. Akmal uh, Akmal Rez is a professor of ophthalmology in the Research Institute uh, of Ophthalmology in Egypt, and he is the head of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus unit in Maghrabia and hospitals in Egypt. Uh, Dr. I'm very excited to welcome you. Dr. Akmal has been my professor and my, and my teacher since I, my residency, and all over my career in Maghrabia and everywhere. So I'm 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 really uh, honored to have Dr. Akmal with, with, with us tonight. We will keep learning from Dr. Ackman from the very beginning until now and for the future and uh, to keep learning from him uh, uh, all the time. Thank you, Dr. Ackman, for coming, for coming and uh, accepting our, our invitation. Thank you. Then I would like to welcome uh, Professor Dr. Craig McEwen, Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology uh, in uh, Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, Middle School of Medicine, Miami, Florida. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. McEwen, uh, um, I, I was glad and was honored to, uh, to have uh, my fellowship with him back more than 10 years ago, see how years are flying. And uh, uh, it was a very interesting time and I learned a lot for, uh, from, uh, from, from him and from uh, other fellows and other colleagues there. Dr. McEwen has uh, visited Egypt uh, twice before um, and we really, was, uh, we really were glad to have him um, in, uh, in Egypt and he always liked to have to be in Egypt and we, we are looking forward for this uh, for the international flights to, get, to come uh, back and then we can invite him uh, back to, uh, to, to us because he already visited our center last year and we're honored to, uh, to have him in our uh, uh, kids eye, eye center and uh, um, we were very glad to, uh, to have him and we're looking forward for his next, uh, next visit. Welcome to Dr. McEwen. Thank you very much, Ivan. Dr. Ayman. Thanks, Dr. McEwen, for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to present to all of you to Dr. Jane. He is a consultant of Thalmic Surgeon and clinical director of services in the Royal Free Ho uh, London Hospital. He is the training program director of for London School of Ophthalmology and Health Education in England. He has re recently been awarded the Fellowship of Higher Education Academy by University of London. 
He is committed to teaching and training and has mentored several residents and fellows over years. He is the author of the uh, Simplifying Strabismus book. And unfortunately, we had uh, first met in the uh, Maghrabi uh, International Conference in Abu Dhabi uh, 2013. Uh, we had a, ver a, a very interesting uh, session uh, for strabismus in the uh, uh, conference <coughs> me, uh, with Dr. Eamon Bonimi, uh, Dr. John Slopper, and many other uh, colleagues. <coughs> Uh, uh, let me present to you Professor Dr. Muhammad Salah, who is the founder of the MIC. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Salah uh, is a well-known uh, cornea and refractive surgery consultant and pioneer for years. Interestingly, has the very uh, he has uh, the, the the very uh, he was very excited to make a project for kids. Uh, he has always been very supportive uh, to support to the pediatric ophthalmology and the strabismus uh, speciality. And so he decided to make the project of the specialized exclusive hospital for the pediatric eye diseases and for uh, strabismus. He was the dean of Mayor uh, from the 2014 to 2018. And then he became the head of the general organization for teaching hospital in the institutes and through all over those years, he was working very, very hard uh, on having this project and this dream come true. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad Salah, for all you have done for all of us and for the pediatric ophthalmology subspecialty in the region and in Egypt. Thank you, Heba, very much for these great words. I really I think I, I am not... Uh, uh, I am not alone. Uh, you and Ayman uh, are my shareholders. <laughs> thank you. Thank our, you. Our honor, actually, dear Dr. Muhammad. And also, I, uh, I thank you very much. Thank you. And here we are, uh, some photos from the Memorial Institute Kids Eye Center. Uh, here are the clinics, the uh, ROP clinic. Um, some few uh, uh, photos from inside the, uh, this is the inward. Uh, department, the OR and the OR rooms. I have a technical problem. The click, the, the, the clicking is, <laughs> is no problem. I have a technical still, problem. You still can see your present yeah, the presentation, you still can see. We can see it now. Okay. Yeah. And now let me present to you all my colleague, dear colleague, Dr. Eamon Gurini. He is a board member of the MIC. He is a consultant of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. He joined the, the Mayor since 2015. He is a consultant of ophthalmology in Mojave Hospital as well since uh, 2003. Uh, he had uh, he had his fellowship uh, in the Maghrabi Saudi Arabia and in uh, the uh, he was a fellow of uh, Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, uh, Miami uh, University. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor, for this, for this nice presentation. Welcome, everyone. And, and let me introduce you, Dr. Heaven Twaldi, my, my dear colleague. She's a board, also a board member in, of MIC. She's consultant pediatric ophthalmology in Mayo since uh, 2012. Um, uh, she is as MD, FR, and she had this, uh, her fellowship in uh, Maghreb Eye Hospital. She joined Mayo like in 2012 and started the pediatric ophthalmology 2013 till I joined the Mayo in 2015 and worked together since then. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, for working. Thank you very uh, much. Work very hard in on every detail. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. I thank you all, uh, uh, and I uh, uh, we want to uh, start over and start our meeting today. And we start with the first section of our meeting, which is the reoperation on horizontal strabismus. The first talk is for uh, Professor Dr. Surab Jain. I will stop my share and uh, to let Dr. Surab uh, um, uh, share his uh, presentation. Dr. Surab, go ahead. The platform is all yours. Firstly, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be speaking in this forum. Egypt is a country very close to my heart. I've visited many times. I've visited Cairo twice. So thank you, Dr. Heba, Dr. Ayman, Dr. Akmal, and Dr. Salah for this great opportunity and really good to meet Dr. McEwen as well. So 
I'm going to talk about something that we see reasonably often. I'm going to talk about um, what do you do um, in a case like this. So this is a 23-year-old Caucasian woman who had a convergence twin since birth. Uh, she underwent surgery at four years of age, according to her mom, and she was initially fine, but now feel that the eyes are not quite straight anymore. So this is how she comes to you. Now, the problem is, as you know, with adults, uh, people of us, those of us who treat adults have a history that you get of the childhood squint is often very patchy, and often there are no records, so you have no idea what is being done. But certainly when I saw her, a few things were obvious. She had a uh, visual acuity that appeared to be normal, uh, left slightly less compared to the right, but on a cover test, she had a significant left exotropia, and that was more for near than it was for distance. So let me just show you what she looks looks like. So th this is her ocular motility. So you can see a significant left exotropia, and I was looking to the right, and you can see the limitation of adduction. I was looking to the left, and if you look carefully here, in fact, I'm going to show this to you again in the form of, uh, so you can see here, there's a few important findings in this case. The first thing, of course, is a very obvious left exotropia, okay? But also when she looks to the right, you can see there's a significant limitation of left adduction. And when she looks to the left, you can see this raised area here where you can see a lot of scarring. So immediately we are thinking of, um, of a muscle that is not working. So it's the left middle rectus that is not drawing the left eye in the way it should be. So what's happened here? Well, this is essentially a stretch scar, okay? Uh, why do I say it's a stretch scar, not a slipped muscle? A slipped muscle is something that happens almost straight away. You do the operation and within a few hours or, or a day or so, the patient represents to you saying um, everything's gone double or the eyes aren't moving the way it should be. When this happens really gradually, the pathology is different and it's because of this, this tendon that has uh, is well, the muscle has gradually gradually slipped as it, as the as the as the scar tissue is much more extensile. So in the end, what happens is you end up with a with a significant recession, much more than what you intended to do. So you have to differentiate this from a slipped muscle. Now, a really important thing, and it's an excellent paper uh, from Egypt, uh, which defines this beautifully. And essentially, they say that late over or under correction associated with limited duction of the previously operated muscle is a stretch scar, and that's exactly, exactly what this is. Okay. So what, what are you going to do for this? Well, it's the middle rectus that is to blame because the eye is not adducting. So we need to find the middle rectus and we need to try and bring it back to where it used to be. A few things I found really helpful in my surgical practice. The first thing is to explore this meticulously. When you go in, you really have to dissect out the layers, the tissue, so you know what is what. And this is really important because you want to be able to differentiate the scar tissue, which is usually whiter, it's avascular, from the muscle tissue, which is vascular, which is more red. And you have to be really careful that you're going to reattach the muscle to the sclera and not the scar to the sclera. And to do that, you have to differentiate it very clearly. I'd like to use non-absorbable sutures to do this because we know that over time, uh, the, the scar can form and it can slip again. And you might have to augment your procedure by weakening the antagonist muscles um, as well, okay? I like to use adjustable sutures, but always, always on the muscle I weaken, not on the muscle I strengthen, just because I'm a bit scared that if I use something that's slip, that can slip on a muscle that I strengthen, I might end up causing inadvertent uh, recession. And a really important thing is to, I think in any reoperation, warn patients about the recurrence and need for further surgery because you really cannot guarantee. Just a very, very quick word about, uh, um, let me switch up the, uh, about doing adjustable sutures. There are many ways of doing it. This is how I do, um, uh, this is an adjustable suture on a lateral rectus. So once you've let the muscle go on a hangback, I put a, a single throw on, on this. And then on top of that, I form a bow tie and I find this works really well. Once you made the bow tie, you leave one end short and one end long. The short end um, is the one that stays where it is and the long end is the one you pull to undo this. And you can actually either bury this under the conjunctiva or you can leave the two ends long and tape them to the chin. Uh, it doesn't matter how you want to do it. But I find for me, this works really well because I don't have to open the conjunctiva to do the adjustment. 
So just moving on now to the management of the consecutive exotropia. Well, we know we have to re-advance the medial rectus, but here's the question. Is that enough? Does I do just do it just by itself? Or shall I do something else? Shall I weaken the lateral rectus at the same time? Shall I resect the middle rectus at the same time? And these are the questions really that we, we all have to ask ourselves when we face with a case like this. Now, my personal view is I don't like to do MR resection in these cases because the muscle's already quite fibrotic. It's, and I would really love to have the panel's opinion on this. And I, I worry that if I do a resection of the MR, I will end up with even more inadvertent restrictive effects. So I try, try not to do that. If I feel that the readvancement is not going to be enough, then I will combine the recession of the lateral rectus. That's the next question then. How do you know if it's going to be enough? What normogram does one use? Is there a special normogram? In my hands, not really. I use the one I use normally, which is one from Kenneth Wright, or really we all have our favorite uh, normogram. Essentially for exotropias, or almost all of it tend to try and overcorrect a little bit. And when I recess the lateral rectus, I'm always happy to recess a little bit more that I need because I can always pull it up. So what I will do is before I start, I will calculate. So say, say this lady has 40. So I say, okay, I need to put a total of 13.5 millimeters of surgery. I go and find the MR, re-advance it to see how much I re-advanced it by. I subtract that from the 13.5 and do the remaining on the lateral rectus. So that's a very simple thing that I do and it usually works very well. So that's it. That's my short presentation on uh, the operation for consecutive exotropia. Interesting, Dr. Jan, Dr. Dr. Surab, it's uh, so interesting that you have uh, this nomogram. Most of us uh, don't have actually a nomogram for the management of uh, the uh, uh, consecutive exotropia when we need to make a re-advancement uh, and reattachment of the media rectus to its original insertion. We have uh, many questions uh, uh, upon this uh, um, uh, situation actually. Uh, um, don't you ever do a, a resection whatever was the uh, uh, the angle of the strabismus but do not do you expect an excellent response from this nomogram if I just advance a medial rectus to its original insertion and I just do contralateral lateral rectus weakening do you expect uh, uh, this uh, uh, to be very effective. How you counsel your patient? You counsel about recurrence, you counsel about uh, patient, you expect consecutive isotropia after advancement of the media rectus to its original insertion? Okay, so so uh, a few things I'll say. For any reoperation, you have to manage expectations because you cannot chase perfection in these cases because the tissues don't behave the way they, sh they, they should. It's not, it's not a virgin muscle. And what tends to happen is when you find the medial rectus, when you bring it back, it never works quite the way that a normal medial rectus works. So sometimes you can get an overcorrection from the readvancement, and sometimes you just won't get the effect because it's a very fibrotic muscle. So you don't really get the contraction that you need. So I always warn the patients that you, they will not get perfection. This is why I like to use adjustable sutures because then you can take off whatever um, whatever you you want by, by using the adjustables. Most of my patients will not let me use the other eye, so I have to do both the, all the surgery on the same eye. But, but that's a very good way to, to have something in your armory for future surgery. And I always say to them that you will need more, you may need more than one operation. If just one operation is enough, we are lucky. And that, that helps me. So you never uh, do advancement of both media recti to its original insertion. So yeah. we need to add the panel, you, sometimes you do bilateral medial rectus advancement? Uh, absolutely. Uh, if, if there is bilateral limitation of adduction, the first thing to do is to do a bilateral MR re-advancement. Absolutely. Okay. So we need to ask a panel uh, uh, about this very important uh, uh, point in the advancement of the medial rectus uh, in consecutive uh, uh, exotropia. Uh, my question now is for uh, uh, Dr. Akmal. Uh, would you do uh, any resection while you are re-advancing the media rectus to its original insertion, Dr. Ackman? So I, I want to start that we should differentiate between the most common 20% uh, consecutive intermittent exotropia after by media recti resection for infantile onset exotropia. And the case that uh, presented by Dr. Sorab, this is because of a weak or extended scar because it was evident before uh, surgery that 
the patient had uh, limited abduction. But my routine uh, procedure for uh, consecutive intermittent exotropia, and we should look for the pathogenesis. To uh, correct infantile onset isotropia, you should go far behind the equator to weaken the contractility of the uh, medial rectus, as well as the patient will lose the tone. So after th some time, the patient will need that tone and transfer it into uh, consecutive intermittent exotropia. And I found them, whatever the angle, I re-advanced the my media recti to original insertion without any resection. But for the case of Dr. Sarab, I should do resection as well for the advanced media rectus because the scar already weakened the uh, muscle. So I add three to four millimeter resection as well. And I wait after that to do another yeah. surgery or not. Whatever the angle, you add the three millimeter resection, whatever the angle, the angle was? For the cases that we call 20% of corrected infantile onset isotropia. Yes. Uh, the uh, infantile onset isotropia, 20% converted into <laughs> consecutive intermittent exotropia. <laughs> Sorry for my dog. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so we have a very... Uh, <laughs> A uh, question from Dr. Uh, uh, Ahmed answered uh, it by the text, by the text, but we would like to uh, uh, hear uh, or listen to the answers from uh, uh, the panelists, most probably from you and from Dr. Craig. What do you think the cause of the stretched scar? What are the risk factors for having a stretched scar? I actually don't know what the cause is, and I don't think any of us do, but it certainly does occur. It took me quite a while to begin to believe in it. I think Irene Ludwig was the original one to describe it, but it certainly does occur. Um, maybe age is a factor, maybe general health is a factor, but it occurs in young children as well. So I actually don't know. Any other opinions okay. on the cause? Yes. Can I say something quickly? And one of the reasons I think it occurs is when if you suture the muscle, you have to suture just the, mu the actual muscle fibers and not just the muscle sheath. And I think sometimes when the suturing is not as good as it could be, you just end up not taking all the muscle fibers with you and end up just suturing the tenon, tenon sheath to the sclera. That's when you do get it. So my fellows get a lot of, they get the same lecture every week, ready to take every muscle fiber with them on the journey, whether they're going front or back. Um, but it's really important. With the, we don't do as much suturing as we used to, and I think it's a real lost art. So you really have to take all the muscle fibers and not just the tenons capsule. So uh, we so, kept the answers of Dr. Emil Bonini to the end because he has many things, tips and tricks to say uh, to all of us uh, about the same problem when you have a consecutive exotropia with a stretched scar. Please, Dr. Emil, the platform is yours. Please share your screen and go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. This was an interesting presentation by Dr. Surab. This was very interesting. So let, let, let me uh, uh, share with you some thoughts in the consecutive XT and continue our, uh, our very rich discussion for this. Well, um, uh, I believe that we, we, we should always, uh, uh, don't forget that, we, uh, that the management of strabismus should be in, in a, step, a stepwise uh, management. Like from the very beginning, correcting the refractive error if we have an ablopia, you have to treat it. Then there is a space for conservative management in many cases of strabismus, and the surgery should be the last option uh, to, uh, to go through. So it's the same thing with the reoperation. For example, if, if, if we face a patient with residual or consecutive, we still have to think in this stepwise management because many cases of residual or consecutive case after, after operation can be resolved by conservative um, uh, management. Uh, like, for example, readjusting the refractive error. For example, if you have a patient with accommodative isotropia, we underwent bilateral media rectus resection, and then he had a small angle exotropia, simply we can reduce the glasses, reduce the hypermetropic correction, and, and he got, it, it turns to be uh, orthotropic. So still, we and of course, if we still have amblyopia, we can push, push in the treatment of amblyopia, and according uh, to the case, what could other conservative measures should be done first before going to surgery. So let's, let's keep this in, uh, in mind. When we are going to plan the surgery, 
the, the cornerstone for this is to have a proper orthotic evaluation of the patient. We have to know carefully the, the measurements, the angle, because most of the cases of reoperations are actually has some sort of incompetency. So that's why we have to have the measurements in line gazes. Sometimes we need, we need the head tilt, and of course the motility and the sensory status, of course. So having a, a perfect uh, orthoptic evaluation is the key to have a good planning for um, uh, for for any extrabismus cases and definitely for reoperation uh, uh, specifically. Let me show you, you know, this is one, one more example about cases of consecutive exotropia. This is 24 years old driver, had previous strabismus surgery in childhood. Um, he, he doesn't have a report, but he had scars over both media recti. So expect that he underwent a, a recession for both media recti. This is the orthoptic sheet of the patient. Let me magnify it. Uh, uh, in, in the primary position, he had exotropia uh, of more than 65 prism diopters. And he had some limited, uh, limited uh, abduction, especially on the left eye, the uh, then the right eye. And he has pseudo action of obliques. So you have overaction of four obliques, which we call pseudo action uh, of obliques. And it doesn't have a significant pattern and doesn't have a significant incompetency. Interesting. Let's see uh, his pictures. This is primary position. And this is his right gaze. As we can see, here, he has a left limited abduction and confirmed by doing abduction. Some improvement, but still he really has some limitation in uh, abduction. And this is his left gaze. And again, uh, this is uh, with his abduction movement. It, it's a very minimal uh, limitation uh, of abduction in, in the right eye. So to design surgery, we have a big angle exotropia. It's near more than distance. If you have seen in the sheet, it's, it's for, uh, for this is about 65. For near, it's about uh, 70 something or 80. And the patient underwent previous media rectus recession. So we decided to explore the media rectus uh, first. And let me uh, put this question to the audience. Let's just share, uh, and if you don't mind our panelists, to have the, uh, the uh, opinion of, uh, of our uh, audience. So please, the first poll question um, uh, to be uh, published, please. The first poll question is, when you have a case of consecutive azotropia with azotropia, uh, uh, after, after uh, 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 well, in the case of consecutive exotropia, where the exotropia is more uh, for near than distance, it's exotropia, not it has been written wrongly. Exotropia is more near than, than distance. What do you prefer? Would you prefer advancing the media rectus? Would you prefer recessing the lateral rectus? Or would you prefer you have another plan? So please, our audience, you will have like 20 seconds to share in, in this. We so. encourage all the audience to share in this, uh, in this, in the, in the poll because we expected for all of us to have different opinions in reoperation. And this is uh, uh, what we are aiming this, uh, in this meeting, to have different opinions. Yes, it's, it's, it was interesting to hear the opinions of Dr. Akman, Dr. McKeewe, and Dr. Sarav. And it's interesting to, to yeah. from the audience, what, what do they prefer or, or they prefer it to be tailored? I think maybe this could be the, the model answer to be tailored to the, to the patient, but I mean, what's the preference? So, uh, if you can now see the results of the poll, it will be interested for the results, please, Muheb. Okay, interesting. So, five percent choose to uh, advance the media rectus to correct the consecutive exotropia. Uh, uh, Dr. Ayman, it seems that this is the most preferred uh, uh, situation. So, but 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 this is in the case of if there is a limited abduction, Dr. Ayman, right? Yeah, it's uh, my question is about if we have a near more than distance, and in such case, when we have really limited abduction, so I, I believe we have to attack this media rectus, as Dr. Ackman has just said, where is the pathology? So we, we have a really weak media rectus uh, that causing limited uh, uh, abduction and causing the exotropia, the exotropia to be more for near than for distance, where we, have, we support the media rectus to work. Uh, so uh, in the operation, uh, the media rectus was, was found about 10 millimeters, 10 to 5 millimeters from the limbus. So my plan uh, was to uh, su uh, suture uh, the muscle. And as you can see here, here there's this part of pseudo tendon also. And far away, you can see that the true tendon. So uh, resecting the pseudo tendon plus resecting part actually of the true of the tendon itself, the true tendon itself, because I felt that this huge uh, uh, amount of exotropia uh, need to have some uh, uh, resection plus the advancement. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't have a normogram, as Dr. Sorab said, we don't have a solid uh, normogram mm -hmm. of uh, how to do it, but this is what I, what I felt that we had to do. And then I suture it in the original insertion, not the, the, the insertion that they found it, in the original insertion. 
And also, optimally, this patient had an initial small angle isotropia. He had diplopia for one week. And of course, the counseling was very important. Thanks for those who shared about this, that, that the diplopia, especially that he was a driver. So uh, I counseled him that we would spend some time without driving and expect to have diplopia. Uh, and the patient turned to be orthotropia just a few weeks after, after the surgery. Uh, the, the limited abduction improved greatly. Still have, have some limited abduction, but actually he was very satisfied now and we are like, more than six months now from uh, from uh, from this search. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to share some small tips about uh, reoperational media rectus. And one more thing is one one th thing is important that before going to, as the Dr. Sorab mentioned, there is a difference between slipped muscle or uh, the stretch scar and also the, the expression lost media rectus. Lost media rectus is when when I lose the media rectus intraoperatively. I'm in the surgery and I lost the media rectus. It's very hard to find it. So you have to, to do all your measures to prevent this to happen uh, by proper uh, security of the sutures. For myself, I use, I use in the media rectus section 5 or vitro instead of 6, six or vitro in, 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 in other service uh, surgeries. And please just don't panic. You can ask for a senior one if you, if, you, if you are not experienced enough. And you can increase the microscope in magnification, elimination. And one important tip, try to avoid rotating the eye laterally. You are trying to search for the media rectus so pulling the eye laterally can get the media rectus to be uh, more and more dipping in the, uh, in the orbit. And then search for the media rectus on its entry to the posterior uh, tenon cap. So this can help a lot. This, this one case where I'm holding the media rectus uh, uh, before, before it goes away. And when I hold this uh, media rectus, I, uh, it, I, I search for it in the entrance with the tenon capsule. And it, it's, it's helpful to find it in this uh, place. One more tip is to try to dip whether this is a muscle or not to look at the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the any bradycardia as for ocular cardiac reflex. And uh, uh, one other tip is to inject saline. The tunic capsule will swell and whiten, but the muscle and the tendon will not. So these are some tips. Again, how to know this is a pseudo tendon. If you can see this short video, you can, if, when you see this, this is a pseudo tendon. This is not a true muscle. As uh, Dr. Sorab uh, said, don't put the sutures in this uh, in this tendon. This is very weak. This is not a true muscle. This is a, a pseudo tendon. So you can see that it's inserted almost in the in the in the original insertion, but the muscle itself is far away uh, from there. So we have to dissect all this and then take the sutures in the tendon uh, itself. Well, this is an algorithm that I, I believe it could be helpful. This algorithm, how to approach a case of consecutive is isotropia, for example. At post BLR, for example, patient with exotropia and underwent BLR, and then the patient uh, uh, developed a consecutive isotropia, for example. Uh, we are simply first. We have to check the abduction. This this would be the first thing. When you have a consecutive, we have to check for the motility to um, uh, roll roll out slip muscle. So when I have a patient with consecutive isotropia, I have to check the abduction first. If uh, if the abduction is limited, and I expect to have some incompetency then if it is early, I, can, I should go for the surgery and do the lateral rectus advancement. But if it is a few, few months after the surgery, I may face the pseudotendon and I have to resect this pseudotendon. However, if the abduction is within normal, so this is just a case of overcorrection, as to start the conservative management glasses or whatever, if there's improvement, that's fine. But if it's not imp improving, I go for the surgery. And for the surgery, then we have the same question, the question that we raised. Would you advance the previous recessed muscle or do you operate on the new uh, uh, muscles? For myself, I, I decided whether there is a limitation or whether it is more distance and need. But one more tip, uh, I think it's important. When I do recession for the opposite muscles, I had to target more than the normal gram that I used to do uh, inversion muscles. Because uh, I, for this case, I will be recessing media rectus and the opposite to media rectus is a lateral rectus that has been already weakened. So I had to decrease the amount a little bit, I had to increase the amount a little bit, especially if the recession was originally uh, high. You can do the same, this the same algorithm if you like it, uh, but in, in the opposite direction, uh, on case of consecutive exotropia after BMR, it's the same thing, you can do uh, the same thing. So thank you and, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, to continue the discussion and to, to learn from, for, from my professors. Uh, interestingly, we have uh, a very nice algorithm for managing a consecutive XT and a consecutive isotropia from uh, uh, Dr. Ayman. Uh, I have many questions, but to tell you some uh, of the questions uh, of the audience, actually, we have a, a very eminent 
اودينس ان بيتيك اوبتمولوجي اند ستروبيزمس دكتور احمد رضا عوضين دكتور حسن صبري دكتور سونال وي هاف كويشن فروم دكتور احمد عوضين وات وين دو يو اكسبلور ذا بريفيوسلي اوبريتد ماسل in any case of consecutive exotropy or only in case you, when you suspect this is a, there is a limited uh, adduction or slept muscle yeah, anemia. Dr. Ayman, the question is, is for you. you. Usually I prefer to, exp to explore the muscle. I really prefer to explore all the muscles. I wish to do so. But sometimes when I have a full, uh, a full movement, uh, I don't have to, to, uh, to I, I don't go for this. Um, so for myself, that yes, uh, yeah, I, I'm not routinely doing this unless I have, I want to tackle this muscle, especially if there is any kind of limitation. And I'll be happy to, to listen to the opinion of other panelists for this. Uh, if you want me to tell you my opinion about this, if you... Please do. Uh, uh, I, uh, I had many cases that uh, uh, from where, uh, from which I learned to explore the previous surgery, even if I have numbers uh, uh, in the, my clinic that tell that it is a simple overcorrection or simple, uh, uh, a simple consecutive ESO or consecutive EXO. I had many cases that needed me to explore the primary surgery before <coughs> going on and do my uh, uh, reoperation plan. And now the question from Dr. Hassan Sabri. Uh, uh, I think resection and advancement of both medial recti uh, and to leave the lateral rectus resection on adjustable suture for a large angle consecutive exotropia with under action of the media recti uh, is helpful especially if uh, he had uh, the patient had previously lateral rectus resection in childhood thanks for your opinion and for sharing your, or your opinion with us dr hassan um, and uh, i have a question um, it might come to my mind in, uh, in in certain situation when i open and i find a very long uh, uh, pseudo tendon and i do advancement and, and the resection Sometimes I prefer to re-evaluate the results after even advancement, uh, uh, advancement and correction of the problem of the stretched scar and leave the, uh, uh, the, leave, uh, uh, the case for re-evaluation after surgery and then to make another intervention. What do you think, Dr. Craig? I agree. When things are complicated and we don't have firm rules, maybe changing one parameter at a time to see what you get is sometimes not a bad idea. Now, if you're pretty sure you're going to get a good outcome and you know that you're going to have to, say, recess a lateral in addition and put it on adjustable suture, you could do that. But I tend to be a one parameter change person to see what we get when things are complicated and don't make sense. I also... Go Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I also like Dr. Jane's idea of using the tables, even though I may not do what the table says, it's always kind of nice to know what would you do if this were a clean case, which these are not, and then go ahead and change it. And there's a couple of little tricks I'll talk to you about in a minute that each of us has in our own sort of armamentarium. Uh, we had another diversity in opinion. Uh, uh, also, Good. Dr. Ayman al waimi used uh, a 5-0 absorbable uh, suture and Dr. Saurabh Jain used a non-absorbable suture. And now let's move to uh, Dr. Craig McEwen uh, uh, talk and representation about consecutive uh, uh, isotropia. Good. Now Craig let's see if I can share my screen or does it happen automatically? Try to share it, yes. Let's see, I lost the, mm. let me raise it up a little higher. I apologize, I have this on mine, but it's not showing up on yours. We all have technical issues today. Mm -hmm. There we go, it should come now. Okay, here we are. It was just hidden by too large of a thing. Are you seeing my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, Good, sure. and then we will put it on slide share. So this on the surface is a fairly straightforward case. Um, and it's a case of recurrent esotropia. It's an 18 year old man who's shown here, who's complaining of recurrent esotropia and diplopia, which have developed over the past two years. And that was initially treated with prisms, which worked quite well for about a year and a half. And over the past six months, we did this case recently, are no longer working. His general health is good, as is his nutrition. Now, 
his past history is significant because he had childhood onset esotropia that started, we think, about three years of age. We don't have records for that. His initial treatment consisted of glasses, which were probably at that time hyperopic and patching. And then he received strabismus surgery when he was four years of age. And at that time, he had a recession of the medial rectus muscle in both eyes of four millimeters. That record we do know. And then he did well for the next 12 years. Subsequently, he experienced recurrent esotropia, as I mentioned, over the past two years. And again, the prisms over the past six months have not worked well. So on examination, his visual acuity is quite good. He has mild amblyopia on the right. The near visual acuity matches pretty well the distance acuity. Color vision is normal. His stereopsis is present, but it's limited, and he probably has the monofixation syndrome with 140 arc seconds of stereopsis. Pupil responses were normal. Pressure was normal, and the lensometry showed a minus one sphere on the right and a minus 1.25 sphere on the left with his six prism doctor base out prism glasses bilaterally, which are no longer effective for him. Anterior segment was normal, dilated fundus examination was normal, and the very important cycloplegic refraction, even though he's nearly 20 years old, confirms that he's not over minus, which would create problems were that to be the case, which is rather common all the way through the 20s into 30. So his versions, as well as his ductions, uh, were quite close to normal. There was a little limitation of abduction, but very minor at minus one, and we even wrote minus 0 0.5 on a four-point scale for the adduction. He had brisk abducting saccades, which I think is a very important thing to check on these patients and other patients with acquired deviations. Now, if we do the cover test and alternate cover test, which we tend to do both, and in this instance, the cover test numbers were the same as the alternate cat test, so it's listed without correction with a fairly concomitant right esotropia at distance, but much less at near. When the glasses go on, the esotropia becomes 20 prism doctors, and this was done with the trial frame, so there were no prisms. But notice the near deviation without correction is only four to six, but with correction is 18. And I suspect that the reason for that is likely to be the absence of the need to do too much accommodation at near because of his myopia. So our impression was childhood onset esotropia, mild amblyopia on the right, the monofixation syndrome, recurrent esotropia after many years causing diplopia, and prisms that no longer are effective. And of course, the history of prior extraocular muscle surgery at the age of four years, and by record consisted of a four millimeter medial rectus recession. So what should we do? Well, I'll run through sort of our options and then we can discuss what others would do. So we could try to increase the prism, but six prism doctors is pretty unwieldy in each eye for a total of 12. And he, we thought, was not likely to tolerate attempts at seven or eight or more prism doctors in the uh, glasses. We could consider surgery, which is exactly what we did. And of course, what are our surgical options? We could re-recess the medial rectus muscle. We could resect the lateral. We could go to one side and do a recess and resect procedure. And of course, the question is whether to use an adjustable suture, which we would favor doing in most instances. And I agree with Dr. Jane. I sometimes do an adjustable resection and or advancement. And then I kind of remember why I don't do them very often. So items that I think may help with our surgical decision-making in the operating room on these kind of cases where the guidelines that we use in the books and the tables and the nomograms may or may not, and our formulas may or may not be accurate. So of course, we look to see under general anesthesia, what directions are the eyes pointed? And in general, they'll be exodeviated. If they're esodeviated, as this person was under anesthesia, and that's fairly deep anesthesia with a laryngeal mask airway, that may have some bearing on our decisions. And then we do, of course, the standard traction test, which all of us do at the beginning of our surgical procedure. 
And then I do it a second way, which is maybe more important. What is the resistance when the muscle hook is placed behind the insertion? And on this man's traction test, it was fairly normal, just slightly abnormal. But when the hook went behind the muscle, the medial rectus muscle on both sides was quite tight. And of course, is the muscle where it is supposed to be? There are many errors in operative reports and dictation, so I always assume the you cannot completely trust the operative reports. And something I also like to do is a qualitative, not quantitative, length tension characteristic determination when I put tractor, traction on the sutures after their place and the muscle is released from its insertion. So there are almost four different traction tests, variations of it that we use to help our, with our decision making. And of course, how far, far from the limbus are the previously operated muscles? So what did we decide to do? Well, both eyes were deviated slightly inward under anesthesia. The traction test showed moderate contracture of the medial rectus. We explored and found that the medial rectus was very close to where it was supposed to be, 10 millimeters from the limbus in both eyes. So we re-recessed both medial rectus muscle 4.5 millimeters using an adjustable suture in this instance on the non-dominant eye. Now, this placed the medial rectus insertion 14.5 millimeters post to the, to the limbus, which is further than it usually is on most of the tables. And your concern would always be, well, this is excessive surgery. Are we going to limit adduction? But in the presence of contracture of the medial rectus muscles, I think that's very reasonable to do. So, he was a little too sleepy to adjust on the day of surgery, which is when we usually do it. So we brought him back the next morning and it turned out that we did not have to change the adjustment. His measurements are shown here, pre-adjustment. So we simply tied down the sutures or using Dr. Jane's technique, you could just pull a loop out. And as he mentioned, there are many various or many ways of doing adjustable sutures. So what are the pros and cons? Well, operating on previously unoperated muscles is often easier and more predictable than operating on previous operated muscles. So if you're experienced with reoperations and you have a good surgical team working with you, maybe not the brand new first year resident, that's probably not going to be an issue. And resection of the lateral rectus does carry some risk on this patient of causing an exotropia near, so we had some concerns about that, and our bias was to plan to do the medial rectus. Now, again, reoperating re on the medial rectus may at times put it further from the limbus than most of the tables would call for based on dose response, but still a reasonable thing to do. And I tell my patients before surgery that I will have kind of plan A, B, C, D, and generally make a final decision on the table. And then I'll take a plastic model that we use with Velcro straps attached to it to demonstrate how we do the surgery. And that was a suggestion of one of my fellows many years ago. So comments and questions. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation, Dr. Craig. Actually, it's a very debatable issue. Uh, uh, some surgeons uh, prefer to make re-recession of the medial rectus, others mm -hmm. prefer to make lateral rectus uh, resection for those cases. Correct. Uh, uh, I want to know the uh, um, from you first, what do you think the cause was? for? What, I what don't know. So he had an MRI scan, the muscles were not enlarged, the saccadic velocity clinically was normal, uh, the muscles developed a contracture. I have seen this before and I don't understand the mechanism. I must say it's not terribly common to go 12 years. So, uh, for, for this patient being myopic, uh, mm -hmm. was, was the, uh, there is an incidence of spontaneous uh, isotropia with myopic patient. Was the mm -hmm. uh, medial rectus, lateral rectus, uh, uh, attachment was um, normal on the scan, on the MRI scan? Yes, but it's very difficult on the MRI scans to see anterior to the equator of the globe because of the arc of contact. So I was mainly looking for problems more posteriorly in the orbit. Did he have enlargement of the muscles, etc., which he did not. I mean the distance between both the superior rectus and the lateral rectus muscle was normal. Now, remember, he was only minus one diopter myopia, so it was very mild myopia. It's, it's a very small amount of myopia. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, listen to uh, Dr. Ekman's opinion about this case. What would you do in this case, Dr. Ekman? 
Please unmute, unmute yourself, Dr. Okay. Ahmed. Okay, I did. I imagine for the pathogenesis, I don't know, but it, uh, it looks like uh, patients who recovered of uh, sixth nerve uh, palsy, those people have angle at far more at near because of the uh, the tone be affected more than the uh, fibers that is responsible for the saccade. So the motility with the red fibers is normal, but with the slow tonic fibers is weak. Maybe this is the cause, but for me, I prefer to do on the operated muscle. I re reassess the muscle, but uh, advice for stra yeah, young strabismologists that to do on unoperated muscle is better for the for them because it is more predictable and and easier because, especially if they don't know uh, the first surgeon so uh, for this case i would uh, do by me direct eye re recession so you will tackle the pathology doctor Ackman. yes i will tackle the both me direct eye we have many questions on this case for you dr craig so, uh, um, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Rubi said, should we give some muscles, cheek ligaments, uh, any attention in some strabismic uh, cases? I don't think scar tissue or check ligaments were an issue here, although I did, I don't always dissect check ligaments and uh, intramuscular septum all the way back on routine cases, but on a case like this where there's contracture of the muscle, I try to go back to its penetration site in t capsule. And I will sometimes use a malleable retractor um, to get back uh, very far. But you do have to be careful about getting into orbital fat, which is not a problem for those of us that do this all the time. Another question from Dr. Dina Hussein. How was the patient's abduction after such a large recession, media rectus recession? It was fine. It was very good. Now, I must, in fairness, admit we just did this surgery recently, so I don't have three months follow-up. But I think it will be okay having done this before. And 14.5 millimeters from the limbus with a fairly tight muscle in general will not significantly affect adduction abilities. I don't know if Dr. Jane and Dr. Akmal agree with that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, but go, go on with questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll get to that later. An option, we, I don't want to fall, to fall behind the time because I still mm -hmm. have a presentation. And uh, uh, I just uh, uh, ask you, Dr. Craig, if you can answer the uh, question by, text, by texting uh, message in the queue. Yes, I, can, okay. I will do that. I will need to do it a little later so I can listen to the talks, but I would be very happy to. Thank you. And we appreciate all the questions. Wonderful. And there are many ways this could be handled, so there is no one way. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Craig. Uh, I will go ahead and share my uh, uh, presentation to share with uh, my opinion a bit in uh, my uh, humble opinion in uh, reoperation on horizontal deviations with multiple uh, previous um, surgeries. Uh, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize because I have many uh, uh, technical issues, I guess, today because I had a laptop accident at the morning. Uh, forgive me. Uh, for this inconvenience. In any cases with, with, with horizontal deviations and many previous strabismus surgeries, you have to search for a primary pathology that had not been tackled. So, uh, uh, search for the primary pathology that had not been tackled is a golden rule in cases, in any case, with uh, uh, multiple previous surgical procedures. I have a problem, Moheb. The slides are not moving. Can you see the slides now? Yeah, we can see the mm -hmm. miscorrection. Yeah. 
Yes. Correction. So the missed correction of the alphabetical pattern mm -hmm. due to oblique overaction is usually the most common cause of uh, 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 mesed pathology and recurrent horizontal deviations. It can cause aggressive post-operative recurrence of the horizontal deviation after many surgeries or even a larger consecutive uh, deviations. Uh, I have, I will show, but just three uh, with many previous uh, surgeries. This patient had already three previous two uh, 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 strabismus uh, uh, surgeries. Uh, for to correct his uh, hair exotropia and every time the exotropia uh, uh, recur and has a very uh, large uh, residual uh, XT. And when examining the patient, I search it immediately for a missed pattern and I find the patient had uh, a missed A pattern uh, uh, XT which uh, had not been corrected in the primary surgery. The previous surgeries was BLR and right uh, recession and right media rectus resection. I corrected the A pattern for the patient by bilateral superior oblique lengthening, and I had a very satisfactory and I uh, had a very satisfactory result. And I added also a left uh, only but uh, left media rectus resection, and I had a very satisfactory result for uh, a very long time. This patient had an exostropia. Uh, of 30 prism diopter and had two uh, previous uh, strabismus surgeries. Um, he had bilateral unequal superior oblique uh, overaction. He had two spine surgery before uh, um, he came to me. Uh, he had bilateral lateral rectus resection, nine millimeters, and then single uh, media rectus resection. And unfortunately, he had a residual uh, a, a, a pattern, uh, uh, B pattern exotropia, sorry, and ASFA, uh, uh, I'm sorry, A pattern XT, 25 uh, present doctor. Um, I uh, did him just a left media rectus detection and I corrected the missed pattern by bilateral severe oblique weakening and I had a very satisfactory results for a long time. So correction of the missed pattern would give you a stable result uh, over a, a long time. Uh, also, this patient had a consecutive XT of almost 50 prism diopter, uh, and she had a V uh, pattern, larger consecutive uh, exotropia, and uh, after uh, uh, strabismus surgery to correct the isotropia. I expected to have a slid muscle or even um, a stretched scar or anything uh, that would could, uh, cause this aggressive uh, consecutive exotropia. And I explored the case to find that the media rectus where, where they are supposed to be uh, five millimeters only from the uh, uh, re, uh, in original insertion. And so the address, the uh, mesed uh, uh, large interior oblique overaction and large V pattern gave uh, actually aggressive consecutive, increased the amount of consecutive exotropia and was the cause of this uh, large uh, consecutive exotropia. I just did the BMR reinsertion, bilateral media rectus reinsertion, and bilateral inferior oblique weakening to correct the problem. And I had uh, uh, the orthotropia in the primary position, the collapsed pattern, and the patient was uh, happy for uh, a long time. And so uh, uh, the mesed pattern would be responsible for multiple, uh, 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 multiple previous uh, reoperation on the same patient to correct the same horizontal. Uh, deviation. Uh, now we uh, uh, reached the end of the first section, uh, uh, which was the um, uh, horizontal, uh, uh, the, the, the horizontal uh, reoperation uh, surgeries, and uh, we expect Dr. Muhammad Salah to say his welcome speech. He also had uh, technical issues, uh, and he could not uh, uh, say his welcome uh, speech to all of us. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, are you with us? It seems that the problem is still there. And so uh, uh, we will uh, shift to the other section uh, in our tonight meeting. And I will leave uh, Dr. Ayman Ghanimi to moderate the uh, session. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ayman Ghanimi, please share your screen. The platform is Okay, so I think it's time to shift now, yes, to for the next uh, uh, section. Okay, the next section about vertical, vertical uh, reoperation. So why don't you start to have yourself with the, uh, your first presentation about the operational third nerve pulse. Okay. But you still have a problem with, uh, with sharing? No, I don't have a problem with sharing. I expect you 
uh, say some questions on my presentation today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Don't talk>. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry I, I had some connection error in the last one minute. I was trying to reconnect it. So I didn't hear the last point. Oh. I wish I wish actually to discuss many, many points in your presentation. Before before starting, let's have one minute discussion for your for your presentation because it was very interesting to talk about the pattern in, in the horizontal devi deviation. I agree with you 100% that I think correcting with the pattern, sometimes we, we, we concentrate on the primary position and we don't concentrate on the pattern and this uh, let the patient not fuse very well and this can increase the incidence of residual consecutive. So uh, let, let, let's hear the opinion of uh, one of our panelists, Dr. Akmal, uh, can you plus, would you, would, you, would you like to comment about this uh, point before starting? our next uh, section about the vertical strabismus? No, I agree, as you said, 100% with uh, Heba, that the most common cause of recurrent strabismus is undiagnosed AV pattern. But I want to ask Heba about what type of lengthening you did for the first uh, patient, lengthening of superior oblique. Yes, so my preferred technique is the split tendon lengthening. Okay. Uh, and I use usually the temporal approach. I am uh, comfortable with this approach and I have uh, usually, I have usually um, uh, reproducible results and this, the superior oblique split tendon lengthening never let me down, actually. Uh, I want to, to, uh, to express about one point for the younger strabismologists that consecutive intermittent exotropia that is controlled by uh, under correction of myopia or elimination of the hypropic correction, it is considered actually intermittent, consecutive intermittent exotropia. It will transfer to actually uh, inter consecutive intermittent exotropia. That's a, I should announce here. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Akmal, for your comments. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Uh, Surab Jain if he want, if he has any comment about the uh, missed pattern in recurrent cases of horizontal business. I thought that was a very interesting presentation, Heba. I completely agree. The only way you'll find a pattern is to look for it. You know, so that I think it's really important to, even if it's a horizontal strabismus, to do a measurement in up and down gaze at least, if not in all nine gazes. And, you know, especially if a pattern is more in down gaze, you really do need to correct it because 90% of our life is spent looking straight and down. So you, I think patterns in down gaze are really important to correct. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Surab. And uh, uh, we uh, now will I will tell you something, Heba. Did you uh, notice that most of the patient with A pattern, they have a limited depression abduction? It's very common. Limited depression in abduction? On abduction, yes. Uh, it yes. might be due to uh, the Yes. The erectus may be underacting? No, Maybe. they don't know. Uh, do you agree, uh, Professor Dr. Craig, that most of the A pattern, they have a limited depression on abduction? I have to say, I have not made that observation, but as you were stating it, I thought maybe I have not looked hard enough. Very interesting. I have seen it on occasion, but not, I would say, commonly. But I may not have looked hard enough either. And these are patients who've not had oblique muscle surgery, correct? Yeah. Good. So, uh, no, very interesting. It may well be true. Another pr problem that I find in our clinic is that if the patients are wearing glasses, sometimes it's the glasses, especially small frames like I have, limit where you go in up gaze, and it's important to get beyond the just central portion to find the A and V patterns or the alphabet patterns. So I want to ask you the same question, Dr. Craig. What is your preferred technique for correction of the A pattern? <coughs> yeah, so if the patient does not is not able to perceive diplopia, it is difficult to undo 
superior oblique surgery of almost any sort if you don't like it. So if patients suppress and have no risk of diplopia, then I think many of the different superior oblique procedures are good. I tend not to do what you do, but my colleague Hilde Capo does and likes it. And I tend to either use a spacer or a chicken suture or an intersheath uh, tenotomy. And I have done that on occasion, uh, but but not often enough to comment uh, with intelligence, but it, it, it's, it works very well. What suture do you use to connect the ends, by the way? I use the non-absorbable uh, suture. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer the proline. Polypropylene? Poly uh, poly poly yes. Or, or mercine. Good choice. Yeah. And I, I will use a 7 0 vascular suture. They tend to be very long with a taper needle. And that needle is wonderful on the, on the thin superior oblique towards its insertion. And of course, it's non absorbable. It's a monofilament, but it has a vascular needle. So you'll need to borrow that from the vascular surgeons or order it special. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Crick, for your comment. Uh, let's step to the second section and go ahead with a slightly a bit more complicated uh, um, problems, reoperation problems. And let me start with the reoperation strategies on uh, third nerve palsy. You know, all third nerve palsy uh, reoperation surgeries are, are usually very challenging, and it's not uncommon problem because actually thirty. According to the literature, 30% of the cases needs reoperation. So the interesting about the reoperation and third nerve is that uh, uh, every case, uh, the management of every case should be tailored. There is no manual, fixed manual for every case to go ahead with the same uh, 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 um, plan. Um, I will present today three cases. Uh, all the cases have been reoperated previously, and all the cases had a conventional left epsilateral lateral rectus resection and the medial rectus resection. This was the first presentation of all those cases to me at the clinic. The first case, the patient had left R and R. He had a left XT, but uh, as you see in the case, he had a, a, a severely limited uh, adduction uh, on the. For seduction test, I found that the patient had a, a tight lateral rectus, and this was the uh, ocular motility chart of the case. My reoperation plan is uh, uh, the left uh, one of the strategies of reoperation on ternary palsy, which is a left free tenotomy of the lateral rectus and the tucking of the uh, previ previously uh, uh, resected uh, uh, muscle. In this case, why I why why I, I choose to tuck immediately the previously uh, resected muscle because I need to get the globe so nasally for the uh, to the nasal side for the lateral rectus if attached then reattached again to the sclera to be reattached very very far uh, posteriorly and in those cases I uh, uh, don't forget to uh, uh, check ever uh, uh, if the superior oblique. Excuse me, mute yourself, please. And in this case, I made a superior uh, oblique transposition to the medial rectus muscle. So, in any case of uh, reoperation of third nerve palsy, don't forget to, the use of superior oblique muscle in your surgery and don't give up on any clinically underacting muscle. Actually, this was the result of the post-operative results. Uh, many surgeons would not agree about the uh, free tenotomy, but it had been widely described in the literature and may think that the deviation would recur. I agree with you, but it's the uh, 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 was my preferred technique in this case, and the case remained stable for five years, but I'm sorry, I don't have the uh, last uh, photo. In uh, the other case, uh, uh, almost the same problem. The patient had residual XT uh, uh, for um, after the conventional surgery, left recess resect, and has uh, had a limited uh, abduction, as you see. In those cases, I know, I know, it's preferred for many surgeons the lateral mm. orbital wall fixation of the uh, uh, lateral rectus to the lateral orbital wall. But uh, uh, I agree about this technique. But sometimes this technique is not uh, not applicable. In this case, she was a very old uh, lady and she was not uh, suitable for the general anesthesia. 
and it was very difficult for me to make to do the lateral orbital work fixation in this case but i do a technique uh, which is my own preference which is the uh, uh, when i have a very tight muscle or or in, in case of recurrent turner palsy or even in some cases uh, uh, mild cases of doing type 4 and synergistic diversion divergence, I do a very large recession of the lateral rectus muscle, even on 15 or 16 millimeters, and then adding a Y uh, splat recession. It's, it's not the usual Y splat recession in the doing cases, small recession and adding a Y splat recession. No, I do it over a very large uh, uh, lateral rectus recession to deactivate the muscle as much as I can. In this case, I used uh, this technique and I did the uh, media rectus uh, tucking and I did the superior oblique transposition and I had a, a very uh, um, satisfactory result. Uh, it, it, be right that there, you have alternatives. So uh, it's the, this is the prepared strategy for me and there is a diversity for uh, the strategy, uh, yeah, strategies to correct that third nerve uh, palsy. Again, in my uh, all uh, strategy, in all cases of pre-operation, I never go to the contralateral eye before getting uh, uh, the best out of the epsilateral eye and then think to correct the, uh, to use the muscles of the other eye. This is strategy usually uh, uh, helps me and uh, very reproducible for me. This another patient, uh, uh, he had uh, the conventional surgery as well, left R on R, but the patient uh, had a residual left uh, XC40 present after and uh, residual uh, a large hypotropia 40 present after. The patient had a complete ptosis and uh, he was dreaming of his left ptosis uh, with any uh, uh, um, way. Uh, as you see, the patient has uh, res had received limitation, uh, limitation of the uh, uh, superior rectus action. Uh, uh, reduction in the left eye. He had severe uh, limitation in this case and uh, I want you to uh, uh, share uh, with me and engage um, and tell me your opinion what would you do for this case. Would you do epsilateral vertical NAPSA procedure or even you do epsilateral superior oblique transposition and contralateral recess resect of the other eye? or you can do left uh, uh, lateral orbital wall fixation, please uh, uh, engage and answer the poll, or you uh, will make no intervention for the patient. Dr. Rebe, can you please show, show us again the, the, the pictures of the patient? Sure. It's quite complicated and, and need a lot of concentration to, to, have, to have an idea and the poll is still there. Okay, so let, let's ask one of our panelists what the till the vote uh, is there. Dr. Ackman, would like to comment uh, about this patient? Dr. Ackman, as you can, please unmute your, uh, your mic, please. Okay. This is after surgery, Heba, the yes. hypotropia. This is after the conventional surgery the patient had before. He just had a left lateral rectus recession and the left media rectus resection. I don't know. And he, he, he didn't have uh, before uh, limited derivation? He, the patient had a complete left cernor palsy. But why there is a introduction? I cannot understand. Mm. Yeah, so this, he, the patient had a complete third impulse and his first surgery was just for attacking the horizontals only. Is this right? We are understanding right, Dr. Heber, right? Sorry, Dr. Ayman, <laughs> I did not get uh, This patient had a complete third impulse and, and well, the first surgery was just attacking the horizontal muscles of the left eye. The previous surgeon just attacked the horizontal and made a conventional surgery. The patient now uh, uh, left hypotropia, 40 plus doctor, left severe limitation in the uh, elevation and deduction in the superior rectus uh, muscle. Uh, and that's it. You can see the, poly, the um, most of, most, there, there is no absolute actually dominance, but 44% but uh, voted for the lateral orbital wall fixation of the epsilateral rectus together with the inferior rectus recession. Unless it is epsilateral superior transposition and only 4% said no intervention. So there is a split 
in uh, opinion between the uh, audience. Uh, let me show you what I did for this patient uh, and what works the most. So my reoperation plan was, first of all, left superior oblique resection and the transposition to the medial side. And I decided to work on the other eye and made a right lateral rectus resection and the left uh, and right medial rectus resection with downshaft of the horizontal recti. But I think to add, I think to add a left uh, superior rectus uh, tucking of this non-acting muscle. I want to improve the belts for this patient to have his poses corrected. I maybe I used the, to 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 um, to make a, a, a epsilateral inferior rectus resection, but I was afraid about the uh, anterior segment ischemia actually. And the other point, I uh, uh, I thought. What would hurt if I did a left uh, a superior rectus uh, tucking? The patient already counseled about the uh, possibility of having uh, uh, other surgeries, prisms, or whatever. And so I did this. And actually, the patient had a very satisfactory results. Uh, see uh, the uh, uh, elevation in A, uh, in abduction in the left eye, the patient can elevate. Uh, uh, his left eye, there is no uh, increase uh, in the hypotropia in the this gaze, the patient or two. So my unpopular opinion, just tucking of a dead muscle uh, would help you when you have a very tight situation. But unfortunately, in this case, in this case, the depression uh, on the uh, uh, abduction was affected and was the patient was counseled about that he chose, uh, he, he chose to have uh, his uh, told us corrected, and I follow up for uh, th this patient. The depression uh, a bit uh, improved, and the patient uh, are satisfied. And I may uh, uh, in the in the future make another su surgery for uh, for him. Uh, I already spared uh, a muscles in the same and the epilateral eye, the inferior rectus uh, muscle, and I spare uh, the muscles on the other eye that I can use in future uh, uh, plan. So this was my strategy. Other surgeons would prefer other strategies. The last case I would prefer for you, this case is to raise the discussion. I know I do agree about the technique about the mesial transposition of the lateral rectus. I use it in some cases and I had satisfactory results in some cases, but in this case, I was the previous surgeon. I was a previous surgeon who needs reoperation. This case was primary uh, primary case. The uh, the patient came to me with a, a, a bilateral uh, asymmetrical third nerve palsy um, and bilateral tosis, as you see in the uh, case. I will show. I hope the video uh, uh, works well. <laughs> Can you see the video or just frames? It's it just a bit interrupted, but I think we can we can, we can see the, mo the the movements. There is a severe yes. uh, limitation of the right abduction, almost minus five, and in the left eye uh, minus one. Come in, come in, come in, come in. So this patient has a, a bilateral asymmetrical third nerve palsy, bilateral tosis. He has a left limited adduction minus one, right limited adduction almost minus five. I choose to do the uh, a right uh, uh, mesial transposition of the right lateral rectus to the right medial rectus, and I strengthen the, the dead muscle by or, or by adding the tucking, and I uh, uh, made in uh, uh, in the left eye left conventional uh, uh, R and R, and this was uh, the results. The patient had uh, exotropia. This the, the results was this result uh, almost two months after the surgery. Um, I had uh, uh, in the primary position exotropia, residual 20 prism doctor, and uh, right hypotropia about 15 to 20 uh, uh, prism doctor. The patient had uh, his left uh, toes, left toes elevated, and he wants now to have his right toes elevated, and he wants me to correct this residual deviation. And I want to know your opinion about this case, what you would have a residual deviation after the medial transposition uh, of the lateral rectus to the uh, medial rectus. And uh, uh, please, uh, uh, Muheb, uh, uh, raise, uh, publish the poll. Uh, do you do, uh, okay, uh, will you do a right inferior rectus recession and retucking of the left medial rectus? I'm talking about 
the media to send the other eye? Or would you do a right superior oblique transposition, transposition if not previously done? Or you can offer the patient to only presence, or you will do nothing and recommend not to elevate the right toes uh, um, in the toes in the right eye. Those are very interesting cases, Dr. Heber. So again, show, show, show us the pictures. It needs very well concentration on every picture and every number. So will you please summarize for us the steps, the surgical steps? So I, I, I did for the patient left conventional lateral rectus recession and medial rectus resection. And I did in the right eye, just right, um, lateral rectus, right uh, medial transposition of the lateral rectus to the medial rectus muscle. And I strengthened, strengthened the medial rectus muscle, the right medial rectus muscle with tucking. That's interesting. And we still have 20 prism diopters in the primary, left 30 on the left gaze, and still this is a significant right hypo. Actually, fusing patients uh, in the cerner palsy are very challenging cases. Yeah, sure. Well, here are the results of the poll. We have 48% suggested right superior big transposition if not previously done. Then 32% with the right inferior rectus recession and retucking of the left medial rectus. And only 8% uh, will do uh, nothing I recommend not to elevate the right toes. So there is, again, we have a split and I'd like to uh, know um, the uh, opinion of the panelists and if they have uh, uh, tricks and tips to have a perfect effect after the medial transposition of the lateral rectus to the nasal side. Dr. Ayman. Dr. Surab, you would like to comment about this, Dr. Surab? I think turner palsy cases are so difficult and it's almost impossible, I think, to get a perfect result. And I think if you chase that, you just end up with multiple surgeries and end up with very unhappy patients. And at some stage, you just have to say, you know, we might just have to accept uh, what we've got. Now, in my experience, super oblique transposition doesn't really work for a long time. You know, the so-called Scott's procedure, I think it works for a short time, but, um, you know, the super oblique tendon lengthens. And anything you do mechanically over time will lose effect. So, so you know, you just have to be aware of, of all these things. And I think, you, you know, have I done a really good job here, actually. Um, you know, if I would do anything, I would, I would probably do the inferior recession uh, that you mentioned with the medial rectus resection. But as we say, you know, it, it is very hard. It's very hard. Yes, it's a very Dr. McHugh, do you have any comments about uh, this interesting case? Difficult case? Uh, very difficult case. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Is my voice coming? Oh, good. Well, I agree with your comment on it is reasonable to resect de-innervated muscles under some circumstances, which our textbooks here typically tell our residents not to do, but there is a time for it. And of course, if the problem is long-standing, there is likely to be changes in orbital elasticity, which will affect any surgery that we do. And that's very, very important. So the longer it's there, the less elastic the orbit becomes. So it's not just a muscle problem, but it's an orbital resistance or elasticity problem. And I do resect the superior oblique tendon. However, frequently with third nerve palsies, the superior oblique doesn't work. And it's sometimes easy to tell, but oftentimes hard to tell. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and for myself, I... I, I I also, although theoretically we don't, we don't uh, strengthen a, a dead muscle, but no. sometimes it helps. Sometimes we really need in, in, in the first short period after the surgery, <clears throat> the, the eye to be shifted to the opposite direction for a while. Although we know that with time, this the muscle got be stretched and this effect will, will disappear well with time. Dr. Ahmed, do you agree about this point? I, I know that you are not a fan of, of resecting a dead muscle. Yes, of course, the, the, the main uh, rule that don't resect a dead muscle. If you resect a dead muscle and to do it like a tendon, you should tell the patient it's temporary, might be one year or two, day, uh, two years. Another uh, advice, don't over recess the lateral rectus. And then after some time, you will get a contractured short muscle 
And the, uh, most of the people, they recess the lateral rectus up to 10 millimeter from the insertion. So you will get a contractured muscle on 10 millimeter from the, uh, the limbus. It is impossible to do another surgery. So if you want to do any for the lateral rectus as a larger session, just uh, tenotomy and uh, lateral orbital wall uh, fixation. Uh, I will uh, tell you the my my technique. If you if the panelists they want to do they want to hear my technique, Please is do. it the time or, or later? Yes, yes, Dr. Ackman, go ahead. Please, we want to know the, your technique and tips and the tricks. Your tips and the tricks in uh, doing the medial transposition of the lateral rectus to the medial rectus muscle. Okay. First of all, I started this technique 2004, the first child, and I think Heba, you 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 photoed the the patient. Yes. yes. So one of the one of your patients uh, five years. You, 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 yeah, you would speak about about the the nerve transposition of the lateral rectus, right? Yes, my my primary procedure that I split. We'll have a video on this operation afterward, but it's very interesting to hear, to hear your opinion about this and then see the video with Dr. of Dr. Surab. Yes, but because I I had only uh, screenshots, but my preferred primary procedure for the total third nerve. So I have only the working two muscles, the uh, lateral rectus and superior oblique. And to me, my uh, opinion that I have, and I see no logic that I put the uh, superior oblique at the medial rectus. To do a transposition of the superior oblique, you are weakening the abducting uh, effect of the superior oblique. So you are transporting the superior oblique in front anteriorly to reduce the abduction. So my, my technique for uh, superior oblique and uh, lateral rectus, I split the lateral rectus more than 20 millimeter. I should split equal two halves, very posterior. And then I cut first the two obliques, the superior oblique, I cut the superior oblique muscle to be transposed in front of the superior oblique. And I cut the inferior oblique to uh, facilitate the uh, sliding of the inferior uh, uh, part of the lateral rectus. So my tip is to equally trans, uh, splitting the lateral rectus, go very more than 20 millimeter from the insertion and be uh, combined with superior oblique transposition. And after the section of the superior oblique at the nasal end and put it in front of the superior rectus in the middle to abolish the uh, intortion or extortion of the uh, superior oblique. Uh, if it is yeah, the failure of uh, total third nerve and the alternative of the, this uh, splitting, I think it is the uh, orbital fixation of the medial rectus uh, by T, uh, uh, titanium T plate or whatever the, uh, the people they want. But uh, this is my preferred technique. I have a lot of patients, maybe over eight patients. The last one was the lady after uh, cancer breast and she, has, uh, she had diplopia. And after this surgery, uh, she has no diplopia. This is, I was happy with this uh, result. Thank you. So your recommendation, Dr. Akmal, is to make a very uh, long uh, split in the lateral rectus, 20 millimeters, to disinsert the inferior oblique and make the transposition of the superior, uh, of the superior oblique in front of the superior yes. rectus and not on the rectus muscle, right? Those are yes. your recommendations. Okay. If you, any unequal, if unequal two halves, you will get a vertical imbalance. Because I remember your case. You did, I think you did the Y splitting, very large splitting under the superior and inferior. So any uh, fibers more uh, powerful, you will get hyper or hypo. I think so. So be cautious that the two uh, halves equal. So you think the cause of hypotropia is not the incriminated superior oblique, but 
the unequal uh, 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 strength of the two halves, the uh, inferior half on the, on the, the superior half, and the, the short uh, splitting in the lateral rectus uh, um, yeah. less than meters. Okay. Might be. Might be. <laughs> I'm not sure. So, uh, Dr. McKeown, how would you correct this case? Uh, you correct this uh, problem? Or you, uh, you are muted, Dr. Is I'm going to mute your mic, please. Apologize. We may be tempted to use the titanium plate, which we'll talk about shortly. In this case, if okay. the restriction is not too severe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I, th I think it's time for Dr. Sorab to... Uh, Before going, I just have one slide, Dr. Ayman. Yeah, please uh, do, please and, do. And we, we, we know that the uh, medial transposition of the uh, uh, lateral uh, rectus muscle is not suitable in reoperation cases. With the patient, when the, when the muscle was previously recessed, we cannot make a, a medial transposition. What do you think about this <laughs> technique? The... the, the uh, fascia later augmented nasal transposition of the split lateral rectus. They lengthened, uh, they lengthened uh, the uh, uh, the upper and lower halves of the uh, lateral rectus with a fascia later, and then make the transposition. It's uh, another idea, just like the uh, hang back technique. What do you think about this? Hey, Dr. Ayman. And I finished. I just asked the, the last question. I finished. Yeah, okay. So I think I think that let, let's have Dr. 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 Surab present his presentation and then we uh, we continue the discussion about and Dr. McEwen has another presentation about the tea the, the tea plate. So let's let's do, listen to them and then continue our discussion about further. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I, I will be very, very quick because I appreciate, um, you know, a lot of this has al already been covered, so I don't really want to, uh, we've already seen that surgery for third nerve palsy is very challenging. Um, it's a very limited goal that, you know, what we want to achieve is to be, the patient to be able to fix, uh, use both eyes to fixate on objects in the primary position and in the leading position. If you can get that, you are doing well. But you have to accept limited motility of the involved eye you will not get an eye that is perfect in every direction of gaze. And this really needs to be discussed with the patient preoperatively, not once, but many, many times. So there's realistic expectation and the patient knows that multiple operations may be required. Uh, we already looked at all these procedures. I'm just going to talk a little bit about this, this technique about the medial transposition, the split lateral rectus muscle for complete third nerve palsy. And, and this is, um, you know, so Bersen, uh, Goichet from uh, Bioglun, uh, Istanbul, talked to me about this technique in one of the ESA meetings, and I've been looking for an opportunity to use it. And I'm just going to, and she uh, wrote this paper, which was in, in, in JPOS, and essentially this shows you the, uh, the view from the top and from the bottom. And this is the lateral rectus muscle that's split into two, is attached superiorly and inferiorly, and she showed some very good results. So. Without wasting any time, I'm just going to show you my, my, my attempt at doing this. So this is the left eye of a patient that the nose is here. So we're going to, so you can see the eye is exotropic. So we got the lateral rectus. And what I do is I put two sutures in it. So uh, just like you do a recession or resection. So I just, I just put two vital sutures so I can uh, detach the muscle. And there's a muscle on your two sutures. And as Dr. Heber was saying that I use a malleable retractor. And then I divide this like a Y split as far back as I can. And you really, you can't do this on a muscle that has already been resected. So then you find inferior oblique and you push. So you have to get this, uh, this strand of the lateral rectus through the, um, it, under the inferior oblique. Now I'm using a right needle. I find this really helpful to then take this underneath the inferior rectus. So that's why putting, putting the suture through a right needle and this is very safe and you can do that. So now your lateral rectus strip is here. This is the medial rectus. So you're attaching it one millimeter posterior to the medial rectus. And you can see you, you use the, the other 
and the other bit here analysis you're doing is superiorly so again superior rectus superior oblique applicated underneath both i'm going to use the right needle to be able to do that so you can see you pass both the uh, needles through it you pull it through and again you attach it next to the medial rectus and once you've done this you're just tightening it you really want to see this little little strip of lateral rectus come all the way up to the medial rectus you have to be able to do that now in most cases this is enough in some cases you may need to uh, combine this uh, as uh, with the medial rectus resection as well but it tends to work quite well so uh, that's all i have to say really um, you know, just to present a slightly different technique yeah that's a very very interesting technique so why dr craig please uh, start sharing your your presentation uh, we can take one comment from Dr. Akmal while Dr. McEwen is sharing his presentation. And please, Dr. McEwen, unmute your, uh, uh, your mic, please. Dr. Akmal, do you have, do you have a comment about uh, the technique that Dr. Sulam has, uh, has, has been showing? I do the same that I was, Sorry? I, I was telling you. I should do very large uh, splitting mm -hmm. and uh, the inferior oblique is already not working, so I uh, may optimize the inferior oblique to facilitate this, uh, the slipping of the lower half. Uh, and I do in the same time my. I don't know if you can show us, if I share the screen, the, a slide of uh, operation. Is it possible, Ayman? I, you, you would like or to share, you, share a picture? Possible. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, Dr. McEwen, if you can, we can let uh, Dr. Uh, yes. Go, yes, please uh, go ahead. I, I have unshared, have I not, or no? I think, Dr. Akma, you mentioned that, that you usually cut the superior oblique in this, while doing this nasal transposition, right? Yes, but I put it in front of the superior rectus, not on the medial rectus. So to be abductor at the same time, uh, it will lose the abducting effect and neutral uh, torsion. Okay. Is it, if I... Do you have any problem sharing? But yeah, I don't know if it, uh, uh, I can share it. I don't know. It is in the mail. Ayman? Yes. Is it possible? Okay, you'd like to be share the, uh, uh, screen, the screenshot <coughs> of, of the operation? Or? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll search for it, uh, but let, let, let's let Okay, it uh, doesn't matter because it's not a, a good resolution, so... Okay, no problem, okay. But okay, that, no, no problem. That, that's that's interesting point. Okay. But I, I'm, unfortunately, I started this operation 2004. That's I didn't publish before. <laughs> Long time ago. Okay, so Dr. McKinnon, yes. would like to start, please? Yes, I'll share now. Let's see. Yeah, is, do you see my screen? It's very, it's very rich and very helpful, but unfortunately, we, we have to move on to catch the time for the yes. webinar. Is the but, screen coming through, Ayman? Yeah, do you yeah, see it? Perfect. Wonderful. I will go ahead and start. It's a, uh, for the young doctors, it's wonderful to be talking about third nerve palsies and so many different procedures because what it means is that there's a lot of room for improvement since none of these are perfect, including the one that I'm about to show you. So what do we do for reoperations or new operations when conventional strabismus surgery fails or is not an option? And I'm going to show two very quick cases. Um, one is a woman with a third nerve palsy from uh, herpes zoster ophthalmicus um, and also affected the third cranial nerve function. And she has very little superior rectus function and inferior rectus function, no medial. The other guy is uh, was in to see us recently with chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia with no function of almost any muscle. And he just wanted to look better because it was frightening his children. So one option is the use of a titanium plate, either a T or L-shaped place. And this was our original description back from almost 10 years ago now when we used a T-shaped plate. And so this is the set that's available in almost any hospital where there are otolaryngologists, oculoplastic surgeons, plastic surgeons. And the one that we are interested in is the one that's here that is a T-shape. And we're going to take the long arm and try to put it in the orbit. So here it is lifted up. 
here's the arrow, and here is a diagram of what we're about to do. So we're going to place this T-shaped plate in the medial orbit, in this case for the medial rectus, but we've done it medially, inferiorly, and laterally, never superiorly for a number of reasons. And we have a non-absorbable suture, usually for us polyester, with spatulated needles. Now this diagram shows the blue T-plate, which is a titanium plate in the subperiosteal space, in this instance in the medial orbit. This particular patient had a transected medial rectus for different reasons, so it's not exactly the case we're talking about here, are these two cases. And then there's our non-absorbable suture, which goes from the apex of the titanium plate through an opening we make in Tenon's capsule, easy to do, and then comes up to the medial rectus insertion. So how do we perform this? It requires two incisions, and it requires an excellent oculoplastics team, and we'll say a pretty good strabismus team, but the oculoplastics people are essential here, orbital folks. So there's a nasal orbitotomy, and the dissection continues posteriorly in the subperiosteal space, which is quite easy to do. There's a few arteries you need to be a little careful about. And then there's a second incision, which is a limbal peritomy, and a posterior opening is made usually with a freer periosteal elevator in Tenon's capsule, and the double-armed polyester suture loop is passed from the globe back through the opening in Tenon's capsule, back through the opening in the periosteum, and brought forward as shown here, and grasped with some forceps. And again, that maneuver is fairly easy to do once the dissection is made. And in essence, what we're doing here are the little red arrows in the lower left show what we've accomplished. The next step is to pre-bend the titanium plate to fit the unique characteristics of this orbit and then tie the polyester sutures at the most posterior hole. And then it's inserted in the subperiosteal space, which has already been dissected, screwed in position. I apologize, this is slightly blurred. The periosteum is being closed in this case with vicryl and now what we're left with is the skin is still open, the periosteum is closed on my arrowhead, and here are the sutures coming out through the limbal peritomy. And then it's a fairly simple matter to take the spatulated needles and pass them either under or just in front of the medial rectus insertion, pardon me. Now, this is our patient. We chose to use an adjustable suture, which we don't always do, but in this instance, I think it was very wise. And the skin is closed. The limbal peritomy is here, and here are the spaghetti-looking multicolored adjustable sutures hanging out. And then this is what the result is. Now, this is a probably six months after the surgery. We have pre-op and we have post-op. And of course, along the way here, her eyelid has been elevated. Now, we counseled this woman prior to surgery that this would primarily be of aesthetic benefit. She would continue to see diplopia when she lifted her eyelid. In fact, it would get worse when we lifted the eyelid for her. But we had a surprising and a surprisingly good result. Sometimes we have surprisingly bad results. But watch what she does. So the titanium plate is not elastic. The suture is not elastic. But watch when she abducts. She abducts remarkably well because the globe retro pulses. There was not a lot of contracture. And because of that, she actually had a very usable field of single binocular vision in contrast to what we had told her ahead of time. So about mm, a year ago, this man came in with chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. These patients are generally not too bothered by diplopia, but this was frightening his children and interfering with his human interactions at work. So we did the same thing. And this is his picture one week post-op. He lives very far away. So he subsequently sent pictures and we've gotten messages from the doctor. So he does not fuse, but he's not particularly bothered by the diplopia and he's had his eyelids elevated. So our original publication was almost 10 years ago now. And there are a few patients in the series that have had very significant restriction, usually from orbital trauma. It could be otolaryngology trauma or orbital trauma. And the ideal procedure is not a inelastic polyester suture, but rather a muscle that's capable of contracture and stretching. So my colleague, David Z, 
in the Dr. Nasser Abraham Al Rashid Orbital Vision Research Center at Bascom Palmer, which is shown here, which is quite new, uh, is working on developing, we hope, an artificial muscle. Now, I must say, in fairness, this has been tried over many decades, including by Alan Scott, and it has not worked out well in the past. We hope this does. And these are his co uh, scientific directors in this marvelous facility. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank you very much for inviting me to this marvelous meeting. And I'm very happy to see Mike is open. I saw it when they were building it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting presentation. So let me ask Dr. Sorabi, do you have any comment about this, uh, about, uh, about this technique? So, you know, this is very interesting. I had not seen uh, this T plate before. We, uh, we've done a, a few periosteal fixations without a T plate. Uh, uh, the, the only one question I have um, to Prof. McKibben is where do you fix the, um, the, the eye? I mean, do you go through the sclera or just through the medial rectus? Oh, oh, very good question. I always put it in the sclera. And I have one patient I'm about to do in the next couple of weeks who is a misadventure with endoscopic sinus surgery who did well for a while, but the eye has gradually moved the other direction. And I think it's because there's a lot of contracture and sutures under tension will tend to erode through. And I don't think the suture is completely loose, but we're going to try to reposition the suture without having to reposition the titanium plate. It'll be interesting to see if that works. So, um, Severe contracture makes this more difficult to do and the permanency of it uh, may not be permanent. And this lady, she fused well in a certain position, but she has gradually regressed and I, we'll find out what it is. I don't think the sutures come untied. I don't think it's torn out, but I think it's eroded part way back. So there's much to be learned. So anyone who has experience with this over time, please let us know what happens and hopefully we'll someday have an artificial muscle. <laughs> yeah, I wish to. Yeah, okay. it'll happen. It's an interesting discussion, but I think we 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 we, we still need need to move uh, forward. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, let me uh, let me let me uh, show you this interesting case about uh, again. Uh, we are still in, in the vertical cases. Um, I, I think you can see my screen now. Am I right? Okay. Okay. This patient underwent three strabismus surgeries before. Um, from her reports, she was being diagnosed as having left monocular elevation deficiency. So in the first surgery, she underwent quite courageous decisions with, with left inferior rectus resection 7 millimeters, superior rectus resection 5 millimeters, and medial and lateral half tendon up transposition to the superior rectus on one session. And from her, the, from her papers and reports, uh, it mentioned that two weeks later, uh, the same surgeon has um, uh, um, entered for what, what he called inferior rectus reposition. Then, after many years, she under, underwent another step with a trial to find the inferior rectus and advance it, but it has been failed and it has been turned for the right inferior rectus precision, six millimeter with padding at 12 millimeter as a trial to help the limited depression on that. So now we ended with, with, with this patient underwent before left inferior rectus resection and superior rectus resection and half tendon up transposition of medial lateral uh, recti and the right inferior rectus resection with padded. Uh, th that's the video of her, uh, of her uh, uh, movements. Oh, I wish it can be clear. She has a significant left hyper. She has this mild limited adduction. As you can see, this left hyper is more in the right gaze. And I'm trying to do the duction and see the elevation on the right is improving a bit. And this is the up gaze. This is the left gaze. And this is the, the down gaze because you can see there's a, a market limited depression, especially in ab duction, in AB duction. And still we have, we have this limited depression on the left and on the right, the right gaze. This is the orthotic sheet. Let me magnify it. We have the primary position, left hypertrophy is 25 for distance and 30 for need, and exotropia. And this left hyper is increasing on down gaze, patient reaching up to 50 prism diopters. And on the right gaze, we have exo 
uh, exotropy is increasing because we have a left limited adduction in this uh, patient too. And of course, this kind of upshoot the, and this limited depression in, uh, in down gaze. So, during the surgery, um, the post duction test was quite negative and the inferior rectus, I, I decided to go and explore the inferior rectus. The inferior rectus, after a long time, I, I, I started to search for it many times, searching, finding some sporadic fibers, and at the end, finally, thanks God, I succeeded to grasp this inferior rectus and found about 14 millimeters from the, rim, from the limbus. So I decided to advance the inferior rectus to its original uh, insertion, because again, we believe that that advancement of the affected muscle uh, should be uh, should be our, our, our uh, main uh, option for this. Also, I've added left inferior oblique mectomy, hoping to improve a bit this, uh, uh, this, this significant hyper, especially in the uh, right gaze. And this is the post-operative pictures for this uh, patient. Um, this patient, as, as you can see, the primary position is quite, quite satisfactory and the depression quite uh, in, in, improved a little bit and still there is, of course, as we as mentioned, as some limited elevation. I decided to postpone attacking the horizontal till I see the results of the uh, vertical uh, point. So I would like to uh, answer that. Would you think on a further next step or not? Let me ask uh, my, my uh, the panel. Would you think about doing something more? Would you think that we should attack the horizontal first? Dr. Ackman would like to comment. Let me get you sure, uh, very nice. Sorry, this is the pre of the video. Your results is very good. I think. That was a pre optive so when, when you attack this, uh, you had the question from the audience before, should we explore every muscle uh, and, and see what, what happens? I expect that this media rectus would be slept, but I decided it would be too much to decide, uh, uh, to decide how much we need after correcting this significant hypertrophy. I decided to attack the vertical and then leave the horizontal in a, in a further step. What do you think, Dr. Ackman? What's your question again? I mean, my, my question is, uh, we, we, in, in such patient, when we had this limited uh, uh, abduction and we have exotropia in the primate, was about 25 prism diopters, should, should we attack the medial rectus uh, in the same setting? Or you agree with what, what I did, that I attacked the, the, the vertical mainly and then I postponed managing the horizontal later on? That's why we ended, yes, we ended with this patient with, with this limited uh, abduction. So what do you think? But the primary position is very good. The patient has no diplopia. I think it's a marvelous result. Uh, and you solved the upshoot. I think it's, uh, if I uh, do the same, I will do what you did. Then fear rectus, you are lucky to, to find it and uh, reinsert it. And later on, he put the medial and lateral uh, up, huh? Yes, in the first as, surgery. Uh, the report? Half tendon. Yes. Half tendon. Yes, yes, I know, but um, no. You I, have, will, uh, I will do nothing. Else. Thank you. I like this result. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. McEwen, do you have a comment? Really? really. No. Thank, sorry. Thank yeah, some, sometimes the enemy of good is better. This is a marvelous yes. result. And if the patient's happy, I might take my time. What do you think, Sarub? I think it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, absolutely. You know, um, you know, if you go chasing perfection, I always keep saying in reoperation, you might end up in a, in a I think you've had a fantastic result. I can mm -hmm. be very happy. I won't have any more. Yes, and is the patient happy? Yes, she is. Oh, then we're I'm happy. happy too, so I'm, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. eager to, uh, to, to intervene again with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm asking. Dr. Heba, do you have about this case? Yeah. I will just uh, follow up the patient because in those cases, I think we might have some, some surprises on follow-up. 
the first the next further step I would do the contralateral pattern uh, and the uh, anterior rectocession if I had uh, increased uh, the, the the left uh, the uh, left hyper uh, yeah. again, yani, uh, I mean and um, pardon which muscle? Sorry. Pardon which muscle? Pardon to the contralateral. Uh, uh, inferior rectus muscle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this, this actually was, was her third yeah. surgery before. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think the previous yeah, the previous surgery they try, tried to do, they tried to find an inferior rectus and they, they couldn't. So they decided to do the right uh, I mean, inferior rectus feather, but it, 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 it seemed that it didn't help too much. I agree about the principle, but I mean, it, it seems that it didn't help too much. Interesting. Maybe you have to think, I mean, contracted lateral rectus, uh, uh, recession that to, to decrease the extropian right gaze. Would, would you think about something like this? The question is for me. Yes. Do uh, you are talking about the exotropia. Yeah, we have had this exotropia on the right gaze. Would you think in adding right left rectus recession? Or the, right, uh, the left mid rectus first. I would explore the left mid rectus uh, first because there is a limited adduction in the case. Yes. Okay. Uh, for me, I'll double check. I, I, I will think twice before doing this because the primary position is quite satisfactory for this. We, and okay. I, if, if I have any uh, residuals in on long term follow up, uh, I'm talking if like, but for this uh, situation, for this result, I would never touch the patient, I would just follow up the patient. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. So let's shift with the, the, the discussion, is very interesting actually. I couldn't so. Um, it's time for Dr. Uh, Surab to, uh, to present his last case. Dr. Surab, if you, if you don't mind, share uh, uh, your, the presentation of your last case. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much and thank you to those who are still here. Uh, this is a very short case, but it really stuck with me because one of this one of the first cases I performed as a as a new attending when I first started. This was a 53 year old male who came to us because he had vertical double vision and he was otherwise okay. He has slightly reduced vision in one eye, which is corrected by a pinhole. But uh, well, I'll, I'll show you his um, his ocular motility. So then you can. So th this is what he looked like. So you can see he's he's uh, he's pretty good in primary. Well, he's got a right hypertrophy and primary gaze and then this is significant when he looks to the left so you can look to the left now and there it goes so there's a significant right over left and it is much more in left case than it is in right case and if i just you can see see that again there and if you look at the measurements so i insist on these nine gaze measurements from my orthoptist and they really help me uh, plan the surgery and you can see here this is where the problem is you know he's got a big right over left uh, in levo depression and uh, and that that is the main thing so because it was so big because it was 36 i and and you can see this also on the hess chart so there's a big superior oblique underaction big intra oblique overaction sr underaction here ir overaction so all the muscle sequelae of a long standing right superior oblique palsy because it was such a big procedure i carried a big big deviation i carried out a right inferior oblique myectomy but also a left inferior recession at the same time because I thought 36 will not be corrected just by one procedure. So, you know, usually these cases are very happy. So this patient came back at day seven and I was expecting him to be delighted, but then the orthopist came back to say, he's really not happy. He's saying, still got double vision, but now it's different, it's opposite to what it was. So that was a bit odd because I didn't expect that to happen. So we got him in and yeah, sure enough, he has double vision, but here's something interesting. It is exactly opposite. So he was right over left. Now he's left over right, and it's most in dextral depression. So it's almost like a mirror image of what he came to me with. So, so, and this is the Hess chart. And again, you can see now there's a left pure oblique interaction, and um, pure oblique overaction, etc. So, so it's exactly a mirror image of uh, of what he came to me with. So, so I was of course very concerned because I'm a new attending and I don't know what's happened. So. Um, is it's an unmasked bilateral force. Now, he didn't have anything else that, you know, bilateral force support. He didn't have a V pattern. He didn't have an esotropy. He didn't have a chin depression. He didn't have a uh, uh, significant excitotorsion, but it, it could have been unmasked bilateral force. 
could it be the effect of my surgery? You know, maybe I did something wrong, there's something else. I don't know, but the patient was very symptomatic and I decided it probably was an unmasked bilateral fold. So I carried out the exact, so then I carried out a left infrared mic to me and a right infrared was recession. So then the patient comes back, this is day two after the second surgery and he's still not happy. So by this stage, you know, of course I'm very concerned. I just still not right, so, and I've now weakened four muscles. So why is the patient still unhappy? Let's look at the measurement. The measurements look very good, actually. It's one, one, no, uh, no excitable torsion, really good. But then look what's happening up here, in up case. He's got in cyclo torsion as soon as he looks up, and this is what's causing him a lot of concern, because he's never had in cyclo torsion before. He was a fourth nerve palsy. So why does he suddenly have in cyclo torsion? So that caused me, again, a lot of um, a lot of thinking. Well, I mean, if you think about it, it's not it's not difficult to understand why does he have in torsion because I have weakened all four of his extorters. Remember, all the muscles that start with an I tend to tend to extort. So I have weakened all of them. So that's why he has now in cyclo torsion. So what should we do? Um, should we do further surgery? Should I transfer to the rectus? Should I transfer the inferior obliques under the lateral rectus, sort of like an inverse harata ito? Or do nothing. So, you know, I was very worried, but I did what I should have done maybe, you know, in the beginning. I just took some time, sat back, said, why don't you come back and see me in a few weeks? Let me have a think of what to do. Maybe I emailed John Lee. And the patient came back at three months and actually was asymptomatic. He was, uh, the I think the reason we could wait so long was because the deviation was in up case. And it's very rare that we just need to look in up case because most of our life is down and straight ahead. So that's why I could wait so long. And actually, you know, he was asymptomatic, there was no ocular deviation, he was discharged. And this case really taught me the importance of, uh, if you're going to weaken all the, um, if you can weaken so many muscles, think of the antagonist muscles and how they're going to cause an overaction afterwards. So that's it. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting pre presentation. And, uh, well, um, Let's have one the, uh, one comment from Dr. Uh, McEwen. Do you, do you like to have one comment, and then I'll present a case that's my case is is, is quite not, not far away from from your case. So let's have one comment of McEwen, and I'll show my case, and then open the discussion. Very impressive result of watchful waiting, and that is a very important lesson for all of us. I think when things don't make sense, if you can, time usually will provide some illumination. So smart. Very good. Smarter than you knew. Also, when you're in a new city or in a new job trying to establish your reputation for the younger doctors, Murphy's Law, as we say, is always at play. Something will invariably go wrong in the first six to 12 months. I had mine. <laughs> we all have. Yeah. Most of I, us. I, I, yeah. I, I have one question for you, Dr. Surab. In the second step, you, you, you did, again, two muscles, the inferior oblique and the inferior rectus. Am I right? That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You didn't think an inferior oblique could, could, do, could do the job enough because I think you had hyper, hyper yeah. like 20 or something after the, after the surgery? That's right. Because again, the problem was it was 27 diopters, the hypertrophy. So I just thought, yeah. you know, I was always being taught that if you do it just the inferior oblique, you'll correct up to 15, uh, which is why I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do both inferior oblique and inferior rectus. Interesting. Let, let, let me show my, my, my last case. <clears throat> Uh, it's 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 it has quite similarity with Dr. Surab case, but um, this this three years old girl presented with this right hypertrophia, or the right over left, like you 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 like to express it. So this patient had this right hyper, and this hyper is increasing on the right gaze and increasing on the left gaze, as you can see here. And this hyper is more in in this case and in the uh, left. A down gaze and a significant, uh, as you can see, a hyper in the right head tilt than the left head tilt. And you can see here the ortho it's, um, it's orthoptic sheet. This patient has right hyper in the primary position, 20 prism adapters, increasing to the left gaze with 40 and increasing the right to the five, so, and, and increasing the right head tilt to be 30. And um, this is significant inferior oblique over action, superior oblique under action. And again, it's, it, it's the same point as Dr. Sal has mentioned that we, this hyper is increasing on, on even the down gaze. So which means that really we have a kind of 
over action of the uh, contralateral inferior rectus. Or, or, uh, as you can see here, this is a summary of her, this right hyper, increasing to the left gaze and ipsilateral tilt. So we are dealing with a case of right superior oblique uh, palsy. So my, my, my thought was that doing, uh, we have to attack this right inferior oblique and I decided to do right inferior oblique uh, recession grade four. And exactly as uh, Dr. Suarez mentioned that we have a significant hyper in the primary and it's, it's like a fallen eye, if, if you, you can call it. And we decided to do the contralateral inferior rectus recession, but I'm more conservative than, than you on this. Uh, uh, I think you mentioned you did five millimeter recession. Um, because of the red slippage of the inferior rectus that we expect that decided to do inferior rectus recession only three uh, millimeters. And post-optively, well, this is the same scenario happened, that with time, she started to develop left hypertrophia to, to the opposite side, and exactly the same picture of having left uh, hyper, of more to the right gaze and more to the left hip tilt. And again, the question has raised, do you think this, this cause of left hyper, and let, let's raise this poll and let's, uh, take the opinion of the audience uh, for this. So we can, we can, uh, if the IT, we can publish this uh, poll, please. The poll, the question is, do you think the cause of left hypertrophia in this patient is a mask of bilateral superior oblique palsy, or do you think the slipped left inferior rectus, remember that uh, I've done left inferior rectus recession, or do you think it's something else? So please uh, vote for this. And let me get, Back to the picture, this, this is her picture. Dr. Ackman, do you like to, uh, to comment about this till we have the uh, results from the audience? Yes, I want to ask Dr. Surab the question. Mm -hmm. What type of myectomy you did? So- Just this insertion? Yeah. So that's interesting you said, because I've actually stopped doing myectomies. It's something that I used to do. And I used to do the central portion of the muscle. I used to remove about one inch or about two and a half centimeter of the muscle. But I find it's not a good operation uh, in my, because in my opinion, because you end up with the uh, muscle ends attaching somewhere. You just cannot control where they attach. So now I would do intraoblique enterization. If I was faced with the same patient, I would do an intraoblique enterization, not a myectomy. Because I, okay. This, okay. The okay. Next, yes, the next question, I didn't hear any about how much extortion before you did the operation, Ayman. I didn't see any measurement for the torsion to yeah. differentiate, to differentiate sure. between bilateral and unilateral. Yeah, sure, sure. And Yes, we, because of her young age, we couldn't do it as objective, but objectively she had the bilateral extortion. That's why when revising the, uh, the herothoptic sheet, we had some alarming signs that she had, may have the muscular bilateral superior. And we can see the audience, 82% uh, 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 suggested that we had, this is a case of muscular bilateral. Let me show you the, uh, the orthoptic sheet. If you can look at the orthoptic sheet, we can see something so it's quite alarming that this hyper is between the right gaze and left gaze is quite significant. So this would be, could be alarming that we have a muscular bilateral superior oblique palsy. And the, but the B pattern was not very significant. She was like E flick down and X10. Usually in bilateral cases, in muscular bilateral case, we see a significant B pattern. For the extortion, objectively, she had extortion in the fundus, both eyes actually. And this was, yes, this yeah. way we thought, we thought from the beginning in, in, in that this, in this really could be a muscular bilateral. And this patient actually has been counseled for the possibility of the second surgery. Because, yeah, yeah, I think I discussed with Dr. Craig because I am coming from another school, from the German school, and um, we did a lot of oblique surgery. What is anterization? What is uh, recession without anterization is very far different from the American school. Because if I find an extortion more than vertical, so I should attack to be posterior, posterization of the fibers. If I want to do the vertical, I should do anteriorization in relation to the insertion, not in relation to the inferior rectus uh, insertion. So it's it's a different school. But <clears throat> so I, I I I should stress that we should routine measure the torsion 
with, sure. with a very يعني, simple and old method using an Oculus uh, Maddox rod with a water level on the top. It's a very easy and very uh, يعني, valuable yes. to tailor your uh, surgery. Thank you. So, uh, Does Rebe have a comment? Does Rebe have a comment? No, no, I don't have a comment. <laughs> okay. So I decided to that uh, I thought that yeah, this is a patient with with mass bilateral superior oblique palsy. So I decided to do left inferior oblique resection, but at this time I made it less than than, than the other eye, and it's, uh, I I made just only a grade two uh, resection. And this is her pictures after the second surgery. So to summarize, this was her picture before any kind of surgery, a right superior oblique palsy case, and then she turned to be uh, mass bilateral, and then the left appeared, and then after doing the left, the, 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 uh, the second surgery by left imperial oblique uh, recession, uh, grade two. And thank you. I think we were lucky today. We have uh, three schools, the German school, the American school, and the British mm -hmm. school. Uh, we were very lucky. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like great. at the end, uh, thank you all. Thank uh, Dr. Craig for us. Uh, thanks, Dr. Surab. Thanks, Dr. Ekman. Uh, we are very uh, uh, sorry for keeping you uh, up late. Uh, and uh, we know the webinar the was advanced. It sorry. passed like this. <laughs> sorry? Yeah, uh, more than two hours. But I mean, I, I really enjoyed this discussion. Mm -hmm. Two hours actually, the reoperation uh, uh, in the business is actually a very, very rich uh, subject or topic for, for uh, and needs many discussion. <coughs> the webinar was very condensed of cases. Uh, uh, we are very sorry for any inconvenience for, for our uh, technical issues, uh, and uh, uh, we hope to see you all uh, uh, in the next webinar. And I'd like at the, at the end thank Dr. Ivan Ronini for uh, uh, his effort and working with me uh, on this webinar. Thank, thank you very much and, and thanks for the audience for keeping following uh, all this time, more than two hours. Thank you really very much. And we're sorry for some questions that we couldn't find a uh, time for to answer it. And uh, But still, uh, this, uh, uh, this webinar, it was live on the Facebook, so still in the comments. Please, uh, if you have questions, uh, don't answer it in this webinar, post it in this comment, and we promise that we will deliver it. To whoever uh, wants to, uh, if this could relate to Dr. McKeown, Dr. Surah, or Dr. Akmal, wherever uh, we will pass them to uh, to them, and and we'll get and we will get the answer to you. Thank you very much, and we have. Thank you. It, I enjoyed Thank it. Thank you for help. Thank you, Dr. McKeown from Miami. Thank you, Dr. Surah from London. Thank you, Dr. Akmal from Egypt, from from Rasheda, actually. Now, thank you, Dr. Heba. Thank you, Dr. Ayman. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for all the audience who appreciate your, your attendance and your share in the polls and the questions. Thank you very much. See you in the next in the next webinars. Keep following our page, the Mikey page, and we will we will post that our our uh, next uh, events. Thank you, and thank, thank you, thank you to Muhammad Salah because he left us uh, <laughs> before, and thank thank him again for all his efforts. Thank you. Thank thank you. Good night. <laughs>